I want to talk to you today about the end of the world is coming soon. That's the way we're supposed to live as believers. That Jesus could come back at any moment. If we live like that, it'll make us more conscious of living a holy life, won't it? It'll make us also more concerned about people who don't know Jesus. It'll make us more concerned about what we say, what we do, what we think. When Jesus, if Jesus could come back any, more, any moment, we need to be ready, don't we? So I want to talk to you about that today. First Peter chapter 4. Very interestingly, the early church believed that Christ could come back at any moment. I hear all these theologians say, oh, this has to happen first, and this has to, nothing has to happen first. Jesus can come back right now in the rapture before I finish this sermon. So, 1 Peter 4. The end of the world is coming soon. Guess where I got my sermon title? <laughs> That's the New Living Translation. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to keep deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Love doesn't get on Facebook and be mean to people. Love doesn't get on Twitter and social media and say bad things. Love covers a mul multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The early disciples were looking for the return of the Lord. The Bible says, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and following, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout. I've told you before, if you don't like shouting, don't die. Everybody in heaven is shouting praises to God. And we don't revel in this, but everybody in hell is shouting because of the pain that they're experiencing with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Isn't that great? Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. It's the Greek word rapio. That's where you get the word rapture. We will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage one another with these words. I don't want to put fear in your heart today. I want to encourage you. Jesus is coming back. Everything in this world is temporary, but our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's coming back large and in charge. <laughs> he's coming back to take over. He doesn't care. What the Democrats say, he doesn't care what the Republicans say. He's coming back, amen? Amen, he's coming back. And he's not, he's not an American God, he's not a Russian God, he's a world God, he is a universe God, he is the God of all gods. Jesus is coming back. So, what do we do? Well, he tells us four things, didn't you see it? Well, if you didn't, here they are. Number one, the end of the world's coming soon, so pray, pray. Look at verse seven. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayer. How many of you know that prayer takes discipline? Anybody know that? You don't always feel like praying. You don't always feel like doing the right thing, do you? I'll ask these folks back here, all right. 
You don't always feel like doing the right things, do you? No. They answered better than y'all did. I always feel like praying. We want to do what we want to do. But how many of you know you can't always do what you want to do? You got to do what God wants you to do. And God wants you to pray. Peter lived in a time when Jesus could have come back at any time. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. He prayed and he believed that Jesus could return at any moment. Where did he get that? From Jesus? He got it from Jesus. The last thing Jesus said before he left was to witness to everybody. And then some angels came and said, he's coming back. Acts 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up, caught up in a cloud while they were watching and they could not see him any longer. And they strained to see him rising into heaven. And as they did, two white robed men suddenly stood among them, men of Galilee. And he hadn't been gone a minute. And here's the first time the Bible says Jesus is coming back. Here it is. Men of Galilee, why are you standing, staring, literally gawking up into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven. Say that with me. He will return from heaven. In the same way you saw him go up, he went up in the clouds, he's coming back from the clouds. He went up into heaven, he's coming back with heaven. He went up with angels, he's coming back with angels. God is a good God, amen. Give him glory and praise. Jesus is coming back, amen. That's why they were to watch and pray. He said, you watch and pray. Jesus is coming back. The Bible says in Matthew 26, Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He wanted them to pray with him. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. That is, pray with me. He went a little further, bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples, found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you keep watch with me even for one hour? Couldn't you keep praying for one hour? What's the deal? Keep watching, keep praying so that you will not give in to temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh, the body is weak. Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes open. That's like some of you when I preach. <laughs> that was not the time to say amen, amen. <laughs> I'm messing with you, don't worry about it. You say amen anytime you want to, all right. <laughs> so he went to pray a third time, saying to the same things again. He came to the disciples and said, go ahead, sleep. Have your rest, but look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They'd been sent by the leading priest and elders of the people. Jesus said, watch and pray, but instead they slept. And that's what some of us do. Sounds a lot like many Christians in America. Did you know that many Christians over in Korea, South Korea, pray nightly, every night, for the liberation 
of North Korea from communism. And did you know that many of them pray from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. every night? Well, when do they sleep? Well, not between those hours. They don't sleep ever. Many of them. I'm talking about thousands of them. And that's one of the reasons so many people are getting saved in South Korea. And I believe many people are going to be saved in North Korea. God's not going to ignore prayers like that. They've been doing that for years. Before Jesus chose 12 disciples, he prayed all night. When's the last time you prayed all night? When's the last time you, people say, I don't have time to pray. What are you talking about? You don't have time to pray. You've got time to pray. You've got time. You can sometimes go to bed a little bit later, stay up and pray. You could turn the television off and instead pray. You get off of social media, get off your, your cell phone and pray. Just spend time with God, talking to the Lord. Our nation is going down the tubes. Americans have turned their back on God, and God is not an American. We have turned our backs on the churches. Most of the people in America don't go to church, ever, ever. We've turned our back on the Bible. We don't even believe it's the Word of God anymore. Every day, over 2,000 babies are killed by abortion in America. High school graduates go into secular universities and come out as heretics. They don't believe the Bible anymore. Many, if not most, of our secular colleges and universities are brainwashing our children with secularism. I'm not just some old guy up here that's spouting off. I know what I'm talking about. And we want to act like nothing's a big deal. Nothing's a big deal. The LGBTQ movement has gained unprecedented progress with our governments, national, state, and local, even in many of our churches, so-called. They want us to say it's okay. I love everybody. I love everybody. If you're a homosexual, I love you. But I'm telling you, homosexuality is a sin. If you're an adulterer, I love you. But adultery is a sin. You can't do those kind of things without paying a price. Most Americans don't pray like it matters. We should. Luke 18, 1 says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Everybody said that together. Always pray and never give up. Paul said in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Say that with me. Let your requests be made known to God. That's what you do when you pray. Well, I don't know how to pray. Well, can you just let God know what your requests are? Can you just start talking with God? You don't have to say some fancy prayer. The end of the world is coming. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. We need to be earnest and disciplined in our prayers. The Lord's about to come back. May he find a praying church. Amen. Then secondly, the end of the world is coming soon. We need to love. We need to love. Look at verse 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Peter encouraged these first century Christians to love each other. Jesus one day quoted Deuteronomy verses 6 and 5, 
Someone had asked him, what's the greatest commandment of all? In Matthew 22, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and the greatest of all the commandments. And then he gave the second commandment, to love people. A second one is e equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, if you do this, you will obey all the law and the prophets. The end of the world is coming soon. Love God and love people. Can we say that together? Love God and love people. In the New Testament, the church of Corinth was a strong church, a wonderful church. They came from a very pagan background. And they started arguing over spiritual gifts, which one was the greatest. Now, I'm not grateful that they argued, but I sure am glad they did in one way, because if they hadn't, we wouldn't have the love chapter. <laughs> Paul wrote to them and said, look, stop the fussing and start loving. If I could speak all the languages of earth, Paul said, and of angels, but didn't love others, I'd only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I could understand all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through every circumstance, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages, and speaking and special knowledge and become, will become useless. But love lives forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity, all that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then, everybody say, but then. Amen. I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Read the rest of this from the screen, if you will. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. How many of you are grateful for John 3.16? Anybody? Read it with me, please, from the New American Standard. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. I'll say this to everybody in the room. Please look at me. God loves you. God loves you. Now, He doesn't love all the things that we do, does He? He doesn't love all the things that we say. But aren't you glad that His love never changes? Amen. I believe God loves everybody that goes to hell. I believe He loves everybody that goes to heaven. And I believe that God wants everybody to fall in love with Him. Amen. I believe anybody can be saved. If I didn't believe that, I couldn't walk up to a stranger and say, Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. No matter who you are, you say, preacher, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't. I don't know what you've done. But I do know that Jesus loves you 
and that he died on the cross for you and rose from the dead. And if you'll repent of your sins and believe in him and trust him and receive him into your life, I know that he'll wash away all your sins. Write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And when you die, you'll go to heaven. And when you live, you'll live for Jesus Christ. Oh, I love the Lord. And I'm grateful I do because the only reason I love him is he loved me first. Number three, the end of the world is coming soon, so give. I didn't expect a amen on that one. <laughs> Verse nine, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But have you ever been down financially? Have you ever been homeless? We think a lot of these folks out here that are homeless are just lazy. A lot of them aren't lazy. A lot of them have gone through very difficult things. We say, well, if they just go to work. Well, I'll just be frank with you. I know that I'm privileged. You may not like what I'm about to say, but I grew up in a home where I had a daddy and a mother. That's one of these, one thing that a lot of people don't have anymore. They don't have a daddy and a mother. And they've got moms that are working two jobs and the kids are at home by themselves. And the moms are working two jobs because the husband left. And these moms are doing the best they can with what they've got. And they can't be a mom and dad too. They can't pour into somebody, these young men. It's all colors too, but it's not just one color. It's whites, blacks, everybody. People are just running out on their wives today. It blows my mind. You can't do that. If you're thinking about leaving your wife, come down here. I'll pray for you. If that doesn't work, I'll slap you on the back of the head. Amen. <laughs> come on, man. Straighten up and be a man. Amen. I may have to get somebody to hold you still while I slap you, but I, I'll get to you eventually. I'm not trying to be cute. I can tell you this. If you neglect your family, I'll tell you who is going to slap you. And that's the Lord. He's going to wear you out if you abandon your family. Be man enough to stay in the game and to be all involved and be the protector and the provider of your family and take your family to church every week. Amen. Every week. Well, what point am I on? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> you need to love each other. You need to love your family. You need to love your church family. There was a man who came to Jesus and he said, uh, What's the greatest commandment of all? Jesus said, love God, love people. The Bible says he tried to justify himself and asked him a question. Luke 10, the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, who's my neighbor? There's a Jewish man who hated Gentiles. He didn't want the Gentiles to be his neighbor. So Jesus replied with a story, a Jewish man was traveling from Jericho down, Jerusalem down to Jericho. <clears throat> I've been on this road several times, 15 times to be exact. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. 
But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. When he saw the man, it's a Jewish man. Everybody say it with me. He felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. He put the man on his own donkey. He took him to the end. What does that mean? The man walked while the injured man was riding. He took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, now take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. And Jesus stops the story. He looks back at the Pharisee and he says, now, which of these three, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, yep, now you go and do the same. He said, well, I don't know who to love. Yes, you do. Find somebody in need. Find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. Say that with me. Find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. Quit thinking about yourself all the time. Oh, I got to put more money in the bank. The economy may get bad. I'll tell you a better way. Why don't you look around with a little bit of that excess money you got and see if somebody else needs something. And I'm telling you, God will pay you better interest than the bank will. God's got a bank. And his bank will never be torn up by inflation or anything else. God's got everything anybody needs. But some of us hoard money. We hoard money. Churches shouldn't hoard money. Christians shouldn't hoard money. Yes, it's okay to save for future needs, but not for future greed. Oh, my soul. Quit depending on your money. That's an idol. And start depending on the Lord. You don't own it. You're just taking care of it. He put it in your pocket. Now, some of y'all are getting real nervous right now. You don't like what I'm saying. So I'll stay after it, all right? Until you get comfortable with it. You don't own anything. You don't own the clothes on your back. If God wants you to give away a coat, I was downtown one day. I'm not trying to sound like I always hear from God. I was wearing a really nice coat. I had just bought it. I walked out of a restaurant. A guy walked by me. He was about my size. He said, man, that's a nice looking coat. And the Holy Ghost said to me, give it to him. He said, how do you know that was the Spirit of God? The devil didn't tell me to give that man a coat. I said, you like this coat? He said, I like that coat. That's really nice. I said, here. He said, do what? I said, here, take it. He took it. It looked good on him. I thought, man, I didn't know I was looking that good. All right, yeah. (laughs) I've heard all my life, that guy would give you the coat off of his back. Now, if 10 of y'all come down here wanting this coat, I'm going to be real suspicious. I'll give it to one of you, but I don't know who it'll be. How many of you know it doesn't matter how many coats you got, it's how much obedience you got, amen? Amen. Most of us have more clothes than we can wear at one time anyway. You can live without loving, but you can't love without giving. When Jesus comes back, it won't matter how much you've got in the bank. 
It'll only how much, matter how much you gave. Read with me Luke 6, 38, and then we'll move on. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Say that last part again. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. That doesn't make sense. But in God's economy, it's not how much money you hoard that you'll keep. It's how much you give. And I got news for you. God's got a lot deeper pockets than you do. If you'll be a giver, God will bless you for it. The end of the world's coming soon. Give. Say that with me. The end of the world is coming soon. Give. Well, the end of the world is coming soon. I need to pray. I need to love. I need to give. But one more thing. The end of the world is coming soon. I need to serve. Look at the last two verses very quickly. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them. Use them well to serve one another. Every one of you has a spiritual gift. Use it to serve other people. Verse 11, do you have the gift of speaking? Speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping? Anybody can help. That's a gift that I think is almost, if not all, together universal. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God. Say that with me. Then everything you do will bring glory to God. How many of you want to glorify God in everything you do? Amen. Amen. Through Jesus Christ. And then Peter gets so happy. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. He, he couldn't stand it. He had to just start worshiping the Lord. Christianity is countercultural in this whole world. Jesus said, if you want to lead other people, you've got to serve other people. Mark 10, so Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you, talking about his disciples, must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Let's all read verse 45 together. Read it from the screen, if you will. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many. Aren't you glad Jesus came, not for himself, to put us in our place? Aren't you glad that Jesus came to put himself in our place? Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. He came to give, not to take. The highway to heaven is a narrow road. It is a narrow way. You can only come through Christ. The broad road leads to destruction, to hell, to death. Many are they that go thereby. In Christ, humility is the way, not pride. Humility pleases God. And so does service. And I say this as humbly as I can. Quit thinking you're such a big shot and realize that but by the grace of God, you'd be a homeless beggar. You say, oh no, not me. Oh yes, you. Don't think too much of yourself. 
If it wasn't for the grace of God, where would I be? If it wasn't but for the grace of God, if he hadn't snatched me and my buddies out of the miry clay, I don't even believe I'd be alive. I believe I would have become an alcoholic. And if I'd married, I probably would have divorced three or four times. And I think I'd already be dead. You say, you're too hard on yourself. Oh, that's given me more than I deserve. (laughs) None of us are righteous in and of ourselves. But thank God, thank God, thank God for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give him glory and praise right now. Amen. For Christians, the end of this world is coming soon. That's encouraging. At least I'm encouraged by it, whether you are or not. I'm encouraged. Jesus could come back right now. Even so, come quickly. He said, what does that mean? In the South, that means bring it on, Jesus. Bring it on. Come on down. Come on down. I pray that I'll live to see the rapture of the church. I pray that even today would be our final day on earth, Christ would come back. And I pray that as you leave this place today, you will contact with people and just say, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And share your testimony with them. Tell them what life was like before you met Christ. Tell them how you met Christ and what he did for you. And tell them what your life is like now. Just say, man, I used to party and be a heathen. I'm not like that anymore. I used to do this. I used to talk bad, cuss. I don't do that anymore. I used to go to places I shouldn't have gone. I don't go there anymore. I never read my Bible. I read my Bible every day now. It's like a love letter jumping off the page. It puts fire in my heart. I pray because I love the Lord, not because somebody forces me to at a meal and I give some little second grade prayer that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. God has changed my life. You can say that. You can say that when you realize that for all of us, the end of this world is coming soon. Jesus is coming back. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's all say that together. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's give Jesus praise right now. Amen. Amen.